This one is 1994. My mother said she was held back. Now, it seemed like I remember we used to say left back, mm. but someone told me it was really held back, and I should have gone into further. It is held back, left back, isn't it? I, I always thought it was left back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Uh, anyhow, I, I was left back myself in the first grade you know, for being a bad boy. And, uh, but uh, that turned out okay because I met my best childhood friend that way. My mother stopped eating. Eating was the last sign of her tenacity, the last expression of her passionate being, except for outbursts, for rare outbursts of, I love you, or grabbing your hand or anyone's and kissing it. I say that first she died, then she quit eating. What she was chewing in her last years didn't provide the nourishment she craved. It's amazing that she went on for so long. Perhaps what would have killed her had she lived longer also kept her from her an insight that would have caused her to despair. Or maybe a relentless, incommunicable despair that inhabited her being was refracted through the prism of her dauntless soul into ecstasy or peace. I had witnessed 54 years earlier in the Catskill Mountains, my mother leaning over the side of a hospital bed and into a pan that my father held, throw up 65% of her blood. I slowly approached her as she was wheeled from her room, an angelic look upon her face, one smile. She said to me, don't worry, Mickey, I'll be all right. Uh, and back to the, future, the present of the poem. Our mother's food tr tray card read double portions. <laughs> and until she'd stopped eating, she scoffed every morsel no matter what. And when the last spoonful was gone, licked the spoons, the cups, the bowls. <laughs> if you put your hand on her arm and asked, how's it going, Mom? She'd brush it aside. You're going to eat me out of house and home, I would tell her, as she once told my brother and me. She also used to say, all I have to do is look at food, and I gain weight. <laughs> and for more than ten years, she'd been eating everything in sight, even off someone else's tray when a new orderly sat her too close to one. <laughs> but her five feet one inches found its equilibrium at 98 pounds. I wonder if the plaque and snarls and her 95-year-old brain prevented her from appreciating that irony. I wouldn't bet on it. I don't give up on anyone, especially she who hadn't given up on me, even when I'd given up on myself. People will surprise you, like when I'd said to my mother a year ago, when she was dressed in calf-high white socks and a girlish dress, Mom, you look like a schoolgirl today. And she glanced at me, then turned her gaze to the tabletop in front of her and shouted, Yeah, I was left back. Yeah. Oh, I said left back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nine o'clock. The last one uh, is from Iowa City poem, even though I wrote it in 1997. I mean, it, ref it reflects, it goes back to that. My Selmer Mark VI alto saxophone. I don't recall if I played all the things you are or just sang the beginning and hummed and scattered the rest. I can't say that Rick, Doug, Audrey, Dr. Dick, Carlos, Dan, Chuck, and Jim and I and whoever else might show up had played songs when we jammed at the bungalow that Rick bought for $5,000 in Iowa City on Bowery Street between Gilbert and Lynn or in the downtown mini park before the new Godfather's Pizza boosted the economy but took from us the park's ambience by removing the bushes we played among. Or at Carlos's pad, so small for our congas and bongos, the saxophone, guitars, both electrified and acoustic, the Goodwill toy piano and kazoo, and we singing, chanting, shouting, stomping, fueled by weed, espressos, friendship, youth, and freedom. No, not whole songs did we play, even when Carlos and Jim, real musicians, kicked us off with one. But it was music, once we got up ahead of steam. 
we'll call it good enough for jazz. But whatever, they can't take that away from me. I confess, I never played a song that's in entirety. I played scales in the back of my father's store after hours, and in my first apartment at 81st in Columbus in Manhattan. Then I played the pawn shop tune to cop heroin, and the parents jingled when I gave to mine the pawn tickets for their wedding silverware. I also held on to my saxophone. I always held on to my saxophone tickets. And one day I was again practicing scales in my Prospect Park West Brooklyn basement apartment after graduating from Phoenix House. And then in a $40 a month room in West 20th before leaving New York where my next door bass neighbor tried to push my door in when he lost his job and came home drunk in the afternoon wanting to sleep it off. I practiced <clears throat> in Iowa City in some of the 12 places I lived, the last of which was the home of Jackson Shirley's, who invited me to stay until I could load all my possessions on a ride or rental truck and move back to New York. I took music lessons from Jim Ulock until the day Jack said, Morty, are you ever going to New York? Now from Marcella, I sometimes play my sax to salsa or jazz that's on the radio or a record. And I play the flute she brought, brought me from Peru and the pan flute she brought me in Russia. I listen to a lot of radio programs from alternative medicine to politics, personal and financial counseling, religion. One day when all the words begin to sound like noise, I hit the next station and take out my sax to join in. My musician, Marcella says. <laughs> And um, <laughs> for the readers, for the, for the audience, and uh, I will sign copies. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>